So what, let's just start out by looking at the, at the texture of, uh, of electromagnetic radiation. And if you look here on the screen here, I've got um, the, I stole this from the web somewhere, electromagnetic radiation running from um, uh, 10 megahertz right here, so that's 10 to the 7 hertz all the way up to 10 to the 20th hertz. And this is a log scale, so you know that it goes on forever in this direction, forever in that direction. So we're only looking at a little bit of it, but actually we're going to be talking about uh, waves that, that, that extend from wavelengths uh, of roughly 30 um, meters all the way down here to waves of just a few angstroms. So 0.3 nanometers is three angstroms. So it's quite a range of, of wavelengths. And as you can imagine, maybe there's not one way of doing this. Uh, yeah. So that's a great question, a great comment. And the answer is no. Um, this extends all the way to, you know, radiation that could have wavelengths of galaxies, size of galaxies, to wavelengths that are way sub uh, angstrom, sub femtometer. And so this is, that's why it's represented here on a, on a log scale here. And what, what I'm going to talk about here really spans this range right there. It's still, you know, 14 orders of magnitude. But but it's a great question. No, the answer is no. It, it, there's no limit to that. And the rules of how they work really extend that entire range, too. So maybe that's the cool thing about it. Um, yeah, so here's, here's visible light right there. So it's a small part of this, uh, this total spectrum. But uh, uh, anyway, let's, uh, let's look at, at this uh, maybe from the beginning here. Uh, what I want to do is, is talk about um, how this, how this, what's the texture of electromagnetic radiation? And it's made up of fields, and those fields are electric fields and magnetic fields. These things represent forces, and sometimes we think about them as that's, that's their only rule, their only role that they play, but they actually are much beyond that. They are physical objects. These fields are physical objects that, that, can, carry, uh, that can carry energy away, and that's what electromagnetic radiation is. And so let's get a start on like what, uh, what are electric fields here? And the place that I wanted to start here was with this balloon here and, um, and my hair, right? So if I do this, I'm transferring electrons from one of these two objects to the other one. And if I do that, I'm told that this really looks silly. Is that right? <laughs> OK, good. I'm at this is a successful demo then. Um, I've, I've introduced charge on one side, and without having to have touching, without having to have this balloon touching my hair, you can see that there's something that's mediating the interaction between these charges that have, have, uh, that have come about from, uh, from this action of, of rubbing it on my hair. Um, and, and if I uh, were to uh, put this on here, I guess it would probably stay. Well, maybe not so well. But anyway, there's opposite charges on these two. Um, on these two uh, objects, my hair and the balloon here. And if I take two balloons here and do the same thing with them, just rub them as much as I can here, um, what is, what's going to happen? Um, I'm doing the same thing to both balloons and my hair. And uh, I let them sit like that. And they don't like being near each other. So what's, what's, what's going on here? Well, there's, there's a field that's, that's uh, that's set up by the charges on each of those balloons, and that field is repelling the charge on one balloon from the other one, and the fields are real, okay? There's an electric field in here. Um, we have another demo right here that's kind of fun to look at, um, and Eric, are you gonna give me a, a chance to uh, uh, almost kill myself? Um, <laughs> this is a, uh, a generator. Uh, it's called a Van de Graaff generator, and it's got a, couple, it's got a belt in here that, that, that drags charge from one side to the other, uh, from down here up to there. And so this thing here gets a, actually a positive charge on it. And Erica's going to turn this thing on. Is that right? OK. And we're the, the, the uh, um, now something funny is going on again. Is that right? <laughs> I can feel it. I can't see it. I'm going to look at the video when this is all over with and see what, what it looks like. Um, but. What's happening is that the, uh, the charge that's in my hair is generating an electric field and is pushing these, uh, these hair, hairs away from each other at, the, at, the, at their end. And that's the, uh, 
manifestation of the electric field that's now coming out of the, the tips of my, uh, my follicles here, okay? Now, can I get out of here now? So go ahead and touch the floor. Oh, I touched the floor, okay, good. She's keeping me alive. How, what voltage do you think I was at there? Uh, I don't know, it's thousands of volts. Thousands of volts anyway, yeah, all right. So you can step off now. I can step off now? That's right, okay. Yeah, no shock, that's great. So, electric fields. Um, what about magnetic fields? Uh, magnetic fields, thank you, Erica, um, are, of course, made by electromagnets or reg regular magnets. They, are, they extend out in space away from this magnet, for example, and you can sort of see that, that they are not something that I have to come in contact with for their action to be seen. If I bring them over this, um, uh, this uh, collection of, of metal objects here, of, of, ferromagnetic, uh, of uh, paramagnetic objects, you can see that, that they were just grabbed and they, they were pulled up um, to, the, to the magnet. So that's... Uh, that's a, an illustration of magnetic fields. So this is so far just static stuff, right? Um, in the mid uh, 19th century, um, Faraday uh, discovered that the um, effect of a varying field was to generate a field of the other kind. In this case right here, and, and his actually was in the case, he was, he was able to show that a, ti a time varying magnetic field generated an electric field. Now, this meter right here is something called a galvanometer, and it measures the voltage. The electric field is the rate of change of voltage in space. So what I'm going to show you here is that if I have a changing magnetic field, um, you're going to see that there is a voltage that's developed um, in, this, in this coil right here. So the coil is intercepting the, um, the magnetic field, and if I change the magnetic field that's, that's passing through the coil like this, you can see that there is a... Um, uh, voltage it develops, but it depends on, on the how fast it's changing. So if you look here, when I stop moving it, the voltage goes away. If I pull it away, I get a voltage of the opposite sign. And so it's the time varying um, aspect of the magnetic field here that generated an electric field. And that's very important. Now, I don't have a demo that shows how a time varying um, electric field generates a magnetic field, but it's exactly the same thing with the difference of there being a minus sign involved in it. So I'm going to turn that off. And now, now that we have the idea that these electric fields exist and that time varying electric and magnetic fields um, lead to uh, the generation of the other kind of field, um, let's look at, uh, oh, here, this is a little slide. This is kind of a, a uh, apocryphal story about the guy that did this discovery here, um, who was Michael Faraday. Um, and he said, uh, the, the guy who was the chancellor of the exchequer at the time, William Gladstone, uh, asked, um, asked Faraday at the time of his inclusion in the Royal Society, uh, what good is it? And, um, and uh, the, the story is that, um, is that Faraday said, well, uh, if, if this uh, is useful as I think it's going to be, you can tax it. So that was, the, that was the, the statement. Now, the problem with this picture here is that Faraday uh, was about 10 years older than, than Gladstone here. So that, that right away makes you wonder if this is possibly, can be, possibly be true. And uh, when I looked into this, I told a friend of mine about the, the talk I was going to give today. And he said, you know that story about Faraday? And I hadn't actually remembered it. And so I went and looked it up. And uh, people now think that that really wasn't true, but that, they, that that was actually said. But anyway, it's a good story. Now, um, let's go ahead and look at what the structure of light really is like here. Um, here there's a sketch that shows um, a, uh, a uh, sort of a sinusoidal, an oscillating pattern of these, these lines here, which are meant to be the, the, the vector fields of, um, th in this case here, the red one, the magnetic field, and the blue one here being the electric field. And if you imagine that the wave is moving in this direction right here, and you're a guy here sitting looking at what's going on, what's, what's passing by you, you're going to see at this point here, if it's moving in this direction, the electric field is pointing down here and it's pointing up there, so it's going to be changing as it moves by you. And the magnetic field then, because a changing electric field leads to a magnetic field, um, takes on this form right here. And so you, you could say, well, this time-varying electric field has generated the magnetic field that we see in this pattern. 
But you could also say that the time varying magnetic field that's happening as, as this wave propagates in this direction uh, is generating the electric field. And in fact, that is the solution. Um, this is the only way that you can uh, explain the, uh, the, uh, the induction of magnetic field from the electric field and the electric field from the magnetic field. And furthermore, uh, it tells you that this wave has got to be moving like a solid body, essentially, in the direction of the arrow uh, with a speed of the speed of light, which um, it predicts what it should be. And if you look at, at this happens, uh, what, you, what, you'd ima- what this actually looks like, you should imagine that you've got these arrows everywhere in space here, maybe, or at least over some, some range of space. And everywhere you look, you see uh, in, in this plane right here, the electric field pointing downward and the magnetic field pointing sort of into the board. So this is the sort of the way I'd like you to think about, uh, about how this, uh, what, this, what this electromagnetic wave looks like. So uh, this was a theory that was put together, oh, in the late 19th century uh, by the Faraday and uh, James Clerk Maxwell. And about the same time, or shortly following that, then there were a number of people that were wondering if they could use this understanding of what light looks like to, uh, to generate some. And, and so this guy right here, uh, uh, Guglielmo Marconi, uh, these are his dates right here, uh, did that. And this is a picture of the first, his, his first transmitter. He, essentially what he did was he had an object right here that would, um, if you electrify it with uh, just wires from a battery, would generate a lot of electromagnetic noise. And the, the noise that uh, it generated here was uh, then, uh, he said, let's just put a, uh, a connection to this noise source here and see if we can somehow pick that signal up somewhere else in space. And in fact, that worked. And the, the, f- the first thing that he tried was not a terribly uh, uh, good uh, design here. But later on, he uh, realized that he needed to have these kind of up and down antennas here to really do it. And he got the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1909 for, for his discovery about how to do this. And so this was, is this an applied Nobel Prize or is this a basic Nobel Prize? I think it's much more of a basic one because this was the first time that anyone had actually demonstrated that you could do something in a lab and generate uh, electromagnetic radiation. Um, okay, so uh, it became clear fairly soon, at least to p- people besides Marconi, that you'd be better off instead of transmitting noise from your antenna, that, and, and of course they were doing, they were doing dits and da's, right? They were doing Morse code at that time. Um, you'd be better off if you were to find a way to transmit sinusoidal electromagnetic waves, just the kind that we had sort of looked at right here, okay? And so to do that, they invented, uh, invented these things here called vacuum tubes, and this is a, an example here of a tube called a triode. It generates current right here, and there's a plate that's put at a voltage that's going to attract the electrons that are going to boil off from this cathode right here. And you can place a control grid between these, and this is sort of a, a very open, you can see it here as well, grid that's going to, you can p- apply a bias voltage to this to retard the electrons that are coming in this direction here and actually turn that current off. And so this was what was actually done uh, first after people realized that they wanted to do this. And here's a picture of an of a local antenna, and we have them all over the place, of course, for broadcasting um, AM waves. And okay, so this is good, um, and uh, I actually have a demo here that shows what actually goes on during that process. And let me see if I can pre- find the right number to press right here. Um, what I've got is a an oscilloscope that uh, is t- tied up to this antenna right here. And um, I'm actually not sure why it's, why it's oscillating right now. Oh, my mic. Let's turn that thing off. It's the mic. Ah. So let me, I'm going to yell for a while. There's the signal. This, this was on the scope right there. It's displaying the voltage that's developing across uh, two wires. There's one that's a red one going down here, and a blue one that's going up, uh, a black one that's going up like that. And that signal is going into this cable, and that cable is going over to the oscilloscope, and you're seeing it on the screen right there. And and you see basically nothing as a function of time. 
So I'm going to turn on now a, uh, uh, a, 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 a microwave, a, mil, uh, a radio wave source, um, and is we have a, an, an antenna, and manifestly we're not connected here. There's a wave that's propagating through and being received by this antenna. And that, that wave is a wave like what we showed in the, in, the, uh, in the sketch there, that blue line going up and down. The electric fields that are coming to me here are being uh, intercepted by this antenna. And if I rotate this by any angle right here, you can see that I'm not as efficient at intercepting them when I'm detecting at an angle that, with respect to the, uh, the uh, emission angle there. Okay, so I can't make it quite go to zero here, but, but that's, the, that's the idea here. So if you had an antenna like that with a, with a vacuum triode um, uh, amplifier, you would see something like this. And now let me turn this off. And, yeah. Um, Okay, so how does that work? We have charge that's moving up and down in the antenna. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you through a few uh, pictures here that show that happening. Here's a charge, that's that, blue, that's that green thing there, and it's moving up and down the antenna like this. microphone? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so that, you can imagine that that happens, right? We put a signal into the, into the uh, uh, antenna, charge moves up and down like this. What happens to uh, the, um, what happens to the radiation? How does that happen? Yeah, so watch this. This is what the equations of physics, physics tell us will happen, and it kind of makes sense too, but let's talk about, let's just watch what happens here. Um, at the very first instant, the, the uh, charge moves up, and this disturbance in the static situation here leads to the emergence of an electric field that can't just sit there. The stuff that we're interested in is the radiation. The radiation has to propagate at the speed of light, and there it goes. Its, it's leading edge has left, at this point, the location where that initial charge was, and as this undergoes this oscillation right here, you see it, um, uh, this kind of thing happening here. The leading edge here has moved a wavelength away from the, uh, the original point right here that, where the antenna is, and it's taken some time to do that. It's taken exactly the right amount of time to do that for the wavelength of light traveling at the speed of light. That's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Um, okay, so this was good, um, and, and, but, but people wanted to, to do, uh, do something better, get more power. For example, the, there was a lot of interest in the 1930s in using uh, radio waves to detect things that weren't right there in front of you. So this was the emergence of radar, the technology of radar. Um, for, the, for the vacuum triode, the grid which had to turn the current on and off very rapidly wasn't a very good way of doing this. And uh, it took a lot of power and uh, it took a lot of voltage to do that. And what you wanted was a lot of power, so you needed to have uh, this happen fast and, and be able to handle a large current in that tube in order to look farther out. So uh, the, what happened was there was some clever thinking by the people I'm going to show you in the next slide that invented a new device here that let them get a lot of power out, go to much higher frequencies, and, and also then transmit at higher frequencies. So these are the guys right here. And they are the people that formed this company that I worked for for about 15 years in the, in the, in the Palo Alto area. And uh, they invented uh, a little gizmo right here that I'm going to describe in a moment that uh, operates on a different principle. And so the, the point that I want to make here is that there's a different principle that's coming up here in this operation here. 
And this was happening in 1937. I think I mentioned that elsewhere as, uh, as well. And you can see that was a timely uh, invention here because of the, uh, the uh, nasty things that were happening in Europe. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to make a device now that's not, no longer uh, uh, operating just in free space. It's going to actually be a, a, a can that holds the, the electromagnetic radiation. This is something called a microwave cavity. And it might look something like this. Here's a perspective view. You might have a hole in one side, a hole on the other side. But maybe these are small, so they don't disturb what's going on inside here very much. And you, this thing here has got an ability to hold microwaves of certain frequencies. And we're not going to talk about the frequencies here, but the bigger this dimension here is, the longer the wavelength of the microwaves are. And conversely, the smaller the dimensions, the uh, sh shorter the wavelength of the microwaves are that can actually fit inside here. Here's a side view. And the electric fields uh, oscillate back and forth in this direction. Um, that's, what, that's the kind of cavities that we want to consider right here. And these are used for a variety of reasons. I want to tell you first about sort of an inverse use that these cavities have. That's a picture there of a, uh, a facility at Argonne National Lab up in Chicago area. And it has, uh, it's a ring. Uh, and it's called a storage ring or a synchrotron. And what happens is that you have bunches of electrons that are traveling in a trajectory like this. And not the other way around. They're, they're traveling like this. And they are bunched in an orbit on a circular trajectory. I, I sketched it to be anti-clockwise. You could also make it with other magnets go clockwise. That's not a big deal. But this one here is just how I sketched it. Now, when, when electrons travel around here, they, uh, are, they, they emit radiation just by being made to go on a circular orbit. And this radiation then has got to be made, that, that, that causes energy to be lost. If they, emit, if they emit energy in the way of radiation, then somehow you've got to, you've got to bring them back to the state that they were in so that they travel at the right speed going around the, the loop. Otherwise, they would just uh, eventually stop. So you've got to add energy every cycle. Uh, or maybe you have several of these cavities here, and you, have, you do it more often. And what you do is you use this microwave cavity that we saw in the previous slide to do that job, to take care of that job. How does that work? Well, um, this is a side view showing the, the direction of the force. And if you imagine these, these circular things here, and I've only showed a few of them, uh, coming into the microwave cavity following a pattern like this. So when the, when the force fields are pointing opposite to the, uh, the direction you would like to provide the force in, nothing's there. When you, this pulse here, when this pulse of electrons moves over to there, this is a sinusoidal thing. So now it's, it's gone to the opposite sign. And the, um, uh, the microwave has changed the force direction here. And happily, that's where the electron happens to be. A half a cycle later, once again, the force is in the opposite direction, but there aren't any electrons there. And so um, the, no work is being done on the electron. Here, there, here positive work is being done. The charges are there. And where, when, the, when the field is pointing in the, in the sort of the wrong direction, then nothing, uh, there's not any, uh, uh, any electrons there. And so there's no negative work being done. So uh, that's fine. Now, you can also run this thing in reverse. You can take the current and run it through in a pulsed form uh, in, in a way that the energy is actually t transferred from the electron beam to the, uh, to the microwave signal. And that's just a matter of, say, I'm going to turn my, I'll, I'll take a movie of this, I'm going to turn my movie in reverse. And I would see exactly the opposite thing happen. Then the charges would be moving in the opposite direction. The microwaves would be then, the arrow, th this red arrow would be in the opposite direction. The microwaves would then uh, absorb energy from the, from the moving charge. So if, if that's true, then if, this is sort of an energy conservation thing. Either you can take energy from the field, from the, uh, ch the charges and bring it to the field, or from the field and bring it to the charges. Uh, let's just see how we could use that. Um, so the big idea here was that you, you can extract microwave energy in our device now using the kinetic energy of the charges. And it's easy to do that. You just have, you get yourself a big battery or a large power supply or something. You get a cathode that can generate lots of current. And you generate a big beam of a strong beam, a high, high current and high energy beam 
of electrons traveling in this direction right here. Um, so what you need to do, though, in terms of uh, what we want to do to synchronize this interaction that we're after is that what we have to do is find a way to synchronize, to, to take this continuous beam and turn it into pulses uh, to drive this, this process, this synchronized process of taking electron energy from, uh, taking energy from the electron beam and moving it into the, uh, into the uh, microwave source. Okay, so how do you convert a continuous beam into a bunched one? That's really the question. The big idea here is bunching. Um, and what you do here is you use two cavities. The first one here is a velocity modulator, and you're sending signals into here that uh, uh, provide, that oscillate back and forth, and as you look downstream here, you can see that the ones that have already passed through there um, have interacted with uh, the field here pointing in opposite directions at different points in the cycle here. So these ones right here, they've lost energy because they have uh, they've intercepted the electric field here in a in a uh, direction where the force is opposite to the direction that the electrons are traveling in. These ones right here have done exactly the opposite. They've gotten a, a boost in their energy. And these ones here have, have lost energy, and this one here has been boosted in energy. So if you just wait for a little while, this, this, uh, this effect here is going to lead to uh, a accumulation of charge right there, and an accumulation of charge right there, and so forth and so on. So you do a velocity modulation, and you get out uh, a, a charge modulation. This is kind of illustrated in this graph right here, which is maybe a little hard to see. Here's a, a continuous beam of electrons that are like blue here. It passes through this buncher cavity right here, and it gets velocity modulated, which leads to the electrons con, con, uh, converging onto these um, regions right here where you have uh, uh, pulses of electrons. And this cavity right here, you synchronize this by the, adjusting the spacing such that the electric field that is existing in here already is, um, is phased in such a way to extract energy and not provide energy to the electrons. And so the electrons come out of here with less energy than they had, and the microwaves come out of here with a lot more power than they had before. And this can, this can get wall plug efficiency of something like 50%. And you could even go beyond that if you do, if you, if you, fool around with this collector right here and try to extract some of the energy by putting retarding potentials on that. So uh, if, you, if you have megawatts of, of electron beam power, you can generate megawatts of, of, um, of microwaves this way. Um, and uh, this is just a calculation that shows how that bunching happens right here. Here's, this is distance down the, uh, the, uh, uh, down the tube here. Uh, and by the time you travel from uh, the bunching region right here, this is the, the effect of the velocity modulation to change the slope of these curves. You get this kind of an effect out here where you've got a lot of, a lot of charge um, and the uh, spacing between them in time is one over the frequency of the wave you're trying to generate. So that's the basic idea of, of this device here called the Klystron. Um, and uh, this, is, this is the... Uh, Notes from 1937 in uh, the uh, lab book of uh, Russell Varian, and it, this is the, the kind of geometry here that he's describing. This is the beam, this is the bunching cavity, that's the extraction cavity. And so these things were used uh, uh, quite extensively in the World War II for radar. They could make these things small enough to fit onto planes, and so you could have uh, radar on. If you're in an uh, airplane, you could have radar and see what's out in front of you. Uh, also on the ground, this is an example right here of a radar system that was up in Canada. And this here, I think, is, yeah, this is the tube that went, that provided the amplification of the power. This would sh shoot out microwaves uh, over the North Pole. It's when people were worried about ballistic missiles coming the other way. Uh, and so I think this is ballistic missile early warning system. I think that's what that stands for. Uh, and they're also not just used for those kind of military applications. This is an example of a, of a klystron that's made by uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, SLAC. And there they were using microwaves to do the kind of acceleration that we saw in that, in that uh, picture from, uh, from the argon advanced photon source. This was for a linear accelerator, not a circular one. But, but uh, this, is, this was actually, I think, not made at Varian. This was made at... Um, at SLAC in their, in, their, uh, in their Klystron facility. 
Uh, and this is just another little thing here. It just shows the kind of bunching that happens. You start out velocity modulated with no bunching. You go a little ways, you get some bunching happening. You get perfect bunching right here. And then if you go too far, you get, again, that, that stretches out and unbunches on you. So that's the, the idea is to, is to put your extraction cavity right there. OK, um, so let's just review. Uh, in the classroom, the key idea was a small velocity modulation leads to a bunched electron beam. The bunched electron beam can be synchronized to extract a lot of its kinetic energy in the form of microwave energy. Bunching is the key thing, OK? Now, I want to step now to, uh, to a different subject, but it's very similar. And this is the subject of uh, free electron lasers. And um, this device here also uses uh, bunching, but it adds to it a relativistic effect that's really a double Doppler shift. And I'll try to explain that as we get into looking at how this happens. This was invented by a guy at, at Stanford. Uh, I think he probably had this idea when he was a, a, a master's student at Caltech. Um, but I worked for him as a postdoc uh, in 1978 to 81. And he had just invented this free electron laser. Then I'll, I'll take you through a little bit of the story of that. He moved around. He had, I think, trouble getting along with people. And uh, I think he went from Stanford to Vanderbilt to Duke and then to University of Hawaii. And he happened to die a couple of years ago. So he was a, he was a, a very brilliant guy. And, um, and I'll show you what he did here, how he in invented it. So this is what it looks like here. Um, we have this thing here. Uh, I'm going to show you it can operate at x-ray frequencies. It can also, the initial one did not operate at, at, at x-ray frequencies. It operated at in the near infrared. Um, what we have here is an electron accelerator. It's shooting a continuous beam of electrons down here. Uh, and here we have an arrangement of magnets, uh, up, down, up, down, up, down. And an electron, if the magnetic field is looking like, is pointing in this direction, an electron coming in this direction, seeing this electric field, will have a V cross B product in that direction, but it's charge minus, so you have to flip your hand around like that. But anyway, it's getting, if the magnetic field is like that, the trajectory it undergoes is, is like this, okay? And that's what's, that's what's illustrated in the sketch right here. Uh, now these are very, very fast electrons. Things can't go faster than the speed of light, but look how close this is to that number. I think there are nine nines there and then a three, okay? And this corresponds to a, an accelerator operating at 13 uh, uh, GeV, and that's, that's not easy to do, but there are, and the world isn't littered with, with 13 GeV accelerators, but there's a, there's a bunch of them around, and they, they are used, some of them are now used for this purpose here, making it um, X-ray free electron lasers. Um, the uh, one that John Mady built at Stanford uh, was not that, uh, did not have that same high energy electron. So there's only four nines here instead of nine nines. Um, and that, that makes a difference. Uh, the, the magnet also, oops, sorry. The magnet also did not look like this. It was actually a double helix of, of, of wires. And that led to a magnetic field that, that did this. It just twisted around like that in space. Um, OK, now. Uh, we have, if we can bunch the electrons, and I'll tell you about that in a minute, um, we have now, we're going to have electrons that are, are doing this, right? But they're also moving. And there's an interesting thing we can look at here about, like, what, is that, what does that give us? Um, you can see now, instead of having my antenna stay still, stay put, look what happens. My, if the electron beam is moving forward as it's oscillating like this, then I have to see, uh, to follow what happens, I need to look like this. See this here? Now, uh, a little bit later, maybe it's the next slide, I'm not really sure. Uh, we're going to see uh, what the consequences of this um, is on the, on the wavelength. But I think you can see here that it's shorter. In fact, for my sketching, when I put this together yesterday, I said, let's just have it be traveling at a speed such that this wavelength right here is half the wavelength it would be had it been an antenna that was stationary. Um, 
Oh yeah, okay, we're doing it right here. Okay, so this is our moving antenna. And we'll recall in a moment here what we uh, saw with our, our stationary antenna. Uh, we saw this. Okay, different, right? What's going on here is all because of the fact that our, our antenna, be like if I had an antenna and I was ru rushing in that direction, you'd see this change in wavelength because of that. Now it's hard to run that fast because it's the speed of light, but it, that's, the, that's the basic idea. And so the wavelength here is just the speed of light divided by the frequency. And we use these symbols here, lambda divided by C, the speed of light divided by F, the frequency. Lambda is the wavelength. Now over here, since this thing is moving, it's the wavelength that we get here is the speed of light minus the speed of the beam over the frequency. Right? That's how much we make it shorter by doing this uh, motion. And so I can, I can write it like this then, uh, C minus B. Now this is a tiny number, right? And I can rewrite it here in terms of the wavelength of the, of the magnet, that's its motion, um, like this. I have the wavelength of the magnet. This is the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation. This is the wavelength of the magnet. And here's this factor here, one minus the fraction of the speed of light that the electron is moving at. Now, this is almost one, remember? It's, it is equal to uh, uh, that number with nine nines on it. So one minus that um, <clears throat> is equal to, I guess, do I have nine, nine zeros here and then a seven? And so this is, this is for this very energetic beam. And so uh, that wavelength here is gonna be enormously shorter than that. And, and let's see, I think I might, uh, no, I guess I didn't. Um, I'll give you some numbers. The, the magnet wavelength is typically something like a few centimeters. Let's say 10 centimeters. Let's say a meter, a meter. I'll say it's a meter. It's, that would be, a, that would be a, a much larger than, than you typically would make it. But if this were a meter, and this is seven times 10 to the minus 10, that means that the radiation that comes out from something oscillating a meter is now going to have a, a, a wavelength of seven angstroms, okay? So that's a huge shift in wavelength and a huge shift. It's a factor of, you know, 10 to the 10 shift in, in, in frequency. So that's why these things are so cool. They, they can let you control this. You can change the velocity of your light by changing the beam of the energy, uh, the, the energy of the beam here and, um, and uh, do things you never could do before. Um, now there's one thing that we have to worry about here, and that is if you start out with a continuous electron beam, we learned from looking at uh, how things work with uh, the uh, klystron that you really want to have a bunched beam to do this. Uh, you would really like it to look like that. And what happens here is that there is a natural force that, that, that leads to bunching as you increase the value of the electric field that you're, that you're generating right here. There's an electric field that gives you a transverse motion and a magnetic field that gives you a transverse motion as well. And that leads to this, this exchange of energy between some electrons where you have some of them that are, that are increased in energy and some of them over, I guess, uh, maybe here that are decreased in energy and you lead to the same kind of bunching that we saw um, in, the, uh, in the case of the undulator in the case of the, um, the klystron. And so this is just some uh, uh, calculations that were done to illustrate that for in the early days of FEL physics. You can see that that interaction of the electric field acting on the, on the, uh, on the electrons that are in the beam uh, leads to an exchange of energy between the beam that depends on where the beam is with respect to the magnetic field. And this uh, leads to an increase in density uh, right here and eventually to a large increase in energy. And this is what gives you your, um, your antenna that is perfectly placed to coherently radiate and be Doppler shifted at the same time. Um, so uh, yeah, after bunching, it looks like a set of antennas traveling to the right with a relativistic speed oscillating in the, ma in the magnet plane. Oh, I guess I, all right. I like this slide so much we have to watch it twice. Okay. And, and here's that, here's that tremendous number. Um, this is a picture of uh, a, uh, a free electron laser, I think, at Stanford. Um, and 
uh, these are some of the parameters that it has. Uh, let's just look here at uh, the wavelength that it can put out. And this is in, in angstroms right here. So you can get as small a wavelength as a half an angstrom. And I think that the energy associated with that is um, something like around 30 uh, kilovolts. So uh, this would be a laser that's providing you with an enormous amount of power at the same kind of energy, photon energy, uh, that you, you have for a, uh, uh, a doctor's x-ray. Okay, that's, those are typically in the, in the 10s to 20, 30, 40 uh, uh, EV. I hear 20, yeah, photon energy, here's 25 kilovolts. And so that's tunable by tuning the energy of the electron beam. Um, let's see, what else to look at here? Peak power is large, uh, gigawatts of peak power. Pulses are short, however, but that can be useful sometimes, like 20 to 16 femtoseconds. You can use that for uh, maybe some coherent excitation experiments. And um, yeah, anyway, that's just the, that's the, um, the uh, summary of the, of the kind of properties that you can uh, get in these, in these beams. And so I, I am done now. And um, what I wanted to do was just uh, say that, you know, uh, this guy right here was, was a brilliant guy. I was really lucky to get a chance to spend a little time working with him. And, uh, and uh, he made possible a brand new kind of uh, photon source, coherent photon source in an energy range that nobody expected you could ever do that. So anyway, I'm happy to take questions. And um, if you uh, want, to, then uh, we can just uh, finish up then. Okay, thanks. Okay, so you have plenty of time for questions. Yeah. Yeah, so I was using that as an analog, okay? Um, let's go back to the, this is a great question. Um, when, when we think about the motion that's happening, where do we have, yeah, right there. That beam, this beam right here, is traveling at almost the speed of light, right? You know, one part in 10 to the 10 or so, seven parts in 10 to the 10 less than that. And so when, when if you can bunch it, if you can bunch it, uh, then what happens is that, that that bunch will travel through here. It'll, it'll be much less than a wavelength long. Let's say it's a tenth of a wavelength long. Then, then as it's doing this, it's doing exactly what the electrons were doing in our stationary antenna for WILL, right? They're just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, right? And that leads to the that leads to some radiation coming off. If you were just sitting in the same reference frame with the electron, you would just see the the light coming off at the period of the wiggler. Of, the, of, this, of this device that's causing this magnetic, th magnetic device that's causing it to wiggle. But you're not, you're sitting in a, you're, that's whizzing by you at almost the speed of light. And so when you look into it, uh, you see this effect that's coming from the, 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 um, the thing we had in the pre next slide, I think, right? Where we have this thing happening. This was not done at this, with a very large velocity. This was, this was what you get if your velocity is half the speed of light, okay? That's still pretty fast, but, but if you're at this, if you make this, let's say you made this a, uh, three quarters of the speed of light, then the wavelength you would have here that you would observe coming off of it would be half of it. And then if it were a tenth of the, a twentieth of the speed of light, maybe then it would be a tenth of this, you know? So it, 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 this foreshortening of the, of the wavelength is caused by the, by the fact that the charge itself is moving as it's oscillating. Uh, back there, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the same function in this slide when we're in the... Oh, yeah, up there. So this actually is the relativistic Doppler shift. Yeah. Um, let's go back. Let's go forward here. Oops. Uh, the, the fully relativistic treatment uh, gives you um, 
Can I get the lights on here? I don't know how to do that. I'm not sure. Uh, I'll try to draw it. Maybe you can see it. Um, it gives you lambda of the radiation, or the electromagnetic radiation is lambda of the of the magnet divided by 2 gamma squared, where gamma is equal to 1 over the square root of um, 1 minus v squared over c squared. But that's equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus v over c times 1 plus v over c. And this here is, is almost 2. And so that's where this 2 came from. And the uh, this is the this is the fully relativistic treatment, and it's exactly the same as that. When you when you realize that that this is just a factor of two, and if you want to convert this factor, so we have we have c minus v here in that equation there, right? That c minus v you can write like that, and that gives you um, the uh, the result. And so it it actually is an interesting thing that you don't have to uh, do anything other than just following the the, what you see based upon the velocities. Yeah, yeah. So there's one more, there's a question back there somewhere. Yeah, did you have a question? Yeah. It probably does that already, as I'm thinking about it now. Um, the, an, a, a charge moving up and down actually generates a donut-shaped pattern of, of radiation. Nothing up like this, but all the way around isotropically in plane, it generates radiation coming out. Now, when it's moving in this direction here, the, the, there's more energy that's, prop, that's propagated in that direction. But there still is energy that's, that is being radiated in the reverse direction as well. We just usually ignore it. So I mean, the, the, that's, a, a, that's an excellent point. You could, the, the, the question would be like, what's going on in all the other directions? Why am I just looking in the forward direction? And, and it's, I think it's a fairly complicated explanation that I'd have to get into about why it varies, the energy actually varies like this, but you can kind of get an idea of that if we're, if we're emitting photons and the frequency of the photon in that direction is much, much higher than the frequency of the photon in that direction, then the energy flow in this direction here will be proportionally bigger than it is in that direction. So that, it's, it's not a very good explanation because you, know, you, you can do this classically without having to invoke photons. But photons' energies are, you're emitting the same number of photons in all directions. It's just that the ones in those, that direction there are much higher in, um, in energy. I, and I don't think so, because it's such a huge difference here. I mean, the wavelength that we have is one meter, let's say. And the wavelength emitted in that direction is one angstrom. The wavelength emitted in that direction then would be, uh, would be something like 10 to the 10th. Uh, meters, so, yeah. More questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, there are uh, a number of them, uh, and I, there's, there's one at Stanford that is now being upgraded. They're, they're at DOE labs. They're all at DOE labs, as far as I know. Oh, well, in the U.S. There's, there's, in, there's in Japan, they, there are, there's at least one or two in Japan. I guess the FEL at JLab used to be owned by the Navy, right? Pardon me? The FEL at JLab used to be owned by the Navy, I uh, think. Okay, I didn't know that, yeah. So there's a, there's a, a lab called Jefferson Lab in Virginia. Yeah. And is that owned by the DOE? Yeah, it's the Department of Energy lab, but, but then like the Navy had the laser, but then they like gave okay. it back to the Department of Energy or yeah. something. Possession of lasers. <laughs> These would be used for things like scientific studies, I think, right now.
Yeah. Yeah, so that's actually an important point. Um, if you have, uh, the question is like, here's one kind of pulse, and here's another pulse, okay? And so maybe I should draw it like this. So there's not a lot of, uh, of peak current here. So this is gonna be your peak current. And here you're going to have a lot of peak current. The fact that you have a lot of peak current means that you're going to get uh, uh, much more emission happening at the early stages of the laser, as you know, it's got a front end and a back end, and that that causes the bunching to happen more rapidly. And so, in order to get what's called the gain to get this thing to actually oscillate. So if we, if we took a, a microphone and put it up next to the speaker, we could make it howl, right? That's the feedback. I don't think we can do it here. If we could, I, I think that I have to find the speaker to, to do that. But um, so that the thing that you have there in the, uh, in the audio system is something called gain. You know, how much, how much is my voice waves amplified by the electronics? The laser is the same way. The, they have a single pass gain, and if you want that thing to oscillate in a single pass, which these things have to do because they're x-rays and we don't have any x-ray mirrors, then you have to have a lot of electrons giving you lots and lots of, per, 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 per uh, angstrom or whatever, to give you a lot of gain to cause this radiation to start up and then really extract a lot of the power. And so um, by, by taking a pulse that might be several, um, picoseconds long, or maybe 10 picoseconds long, and squishing it down like that and causing the current density to get be very high, you actually increase the gain right, then and right there for the radiation that's at that, at that location in space. Um, and uh, it's still quite a few oscillations, because remember the wavelength is only, uh, it's only uh, uh, maybe an angstrom long, uh, but um, that's the reason, I guess. I, I think there would be from space charge effects. If, the more you, you take that, those charges and you bring them close together, you make that charge density high, the more just the charges themselves as they're zipping along at the speed of light are gonna see uh, forces that, that tend to push them apart. Like the same as the balloons. Yeah, 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 it's, it's, like it's kind of like the balloons, sure, yeah. So there, that, is that a basic, that, maybe that, I answered that wrong. It's not a basic limit, it's a practical limit, it's an engineering limit. They are biological in nature uh, because there's a lot you can learn about, about biological molecules by doing various kinds of advanced x-ray um, studies on them, scattering. I know that. Uh, as far as medical in terms of like shooting into me, or you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that the, 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 uh, this, this company actually, Varian, which makes klystrons, um, they uh, are, one of their big businesses now is in exactly what you said there. They, they make little, little linear accelerators that are about like a, few, a meter or two meters long, and then they accelerate electron beams, and they blast those electron beams into a tungsten target, and out from that comes in an incoherent process, nothing like what we've talked about here, uh, uh, gamma rays that are used for, for cancer treatment. And that is uh, something that's now at the, uh, at the megavolt energy range for the, for the, for the, uh, for the uh, gamma ray photon that comes off here. It's way out on the left side of that diagram that I had before. These devices right now, even this X-ray FEL, it's, it sounds amazing, it's great. 
is about a thousand times less uh, energetic per photon than what uh, is typically used now with these other cancer therapy machines. So I think that the, it would take sort of a revolution in, um, in uh, technology or a clever idea or something like that to get to the, to, to get the photon energy from something like these devices here up to the level that is used in uh, cancer therapy machines. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's an, people have been talking about that for a long time, right? I remember 20 years ago, uh, people were discussing this. And there are, there, are two, there are two answers. One is yes, and the other is no, right? <laughs> and, and let me tell you what, something I know about this. The, the no answer would say the frequency of that, of that, aura, that radiation that you have, uh, cell phone radiation or, um, or from power lines, um, is somewhere between 100 hertz and, and maybe 2 gigahertz, okay? And that is, from the point of view of chemistry, uh, a, represents uh, energy buckets or energy stuff that is not energetic enough. The photon does not have enough energy to, to interact with uh, a, a molecule and be absorbed by that. So that's the no side. The yes side says that that's not what really you worry about. What you really should worry about would be um, larger structures where the electric field that comes from the, uh, this, this um, radiation you don't want to be exposed to is moving things like uh, interfaces between the inside and the outside of a cell. You know, cells have, cells have pores to them, right, that are, that are big enough, and if you if you were to heat them up a little bit, would that change the, the, the dynamics of a cell? So now you're not talking about chemistry anymore. You're talking about biology. So I, the, I guess just thinking about it now, the people that say yes are worrying about the biology, and the people that say no are worried about the chemistry. And so what's the right answer? Of course, I don't know. I have no idea. But um, I think that's my take on it. Yeah. 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 So we see a lot of uh, voltage difference. Yeah, let's go take a peek. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, I think that that 10 to the 18 hertz point, lambda equals 0.3 nanometers, I put that there because I thought that's where it belonged. That, that would be the, uh, that would be the, um, the wavelength of the radiation from a, wig, from a free electron laser that had a, a period about this big and the electron beam is 13 GeV. Yeah, not, not very deep x-rays. I mean, this here, whoops, wrong, wrong thing. Um, this here is uh, an x-ray. Uh, this is the frequency of the x-ray. The energy of this x-ray, uh, let's see, um, is I think we said about 25 kilovolts of, of energy. So, and, and, and I was also mentioning that at that time that when you go to the doctor and get a chest x-ray or something, I think those are typically around 50 kilovolts. So it's in the ballpark of uh, medical x-rays for diagnostic purposes like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if I took a, if this were a free electron laser, I'd have to be careful with it, yeah. Yeah. In, in principle, it could, because the focusing depends on the wavelength. If you've got a large wavelength, you can't focus it down to a, yeah, here, you can't focus down a, a, a light beam 
to much anything smaller than um, a half a wavelength of that light. So our, our typical you know, light here in the room is 5,000 angstroms. Uh, the x-ray that we're talking about here is more like one angstrom, right? So maybe five angstroms. So there's at least a factor of 1,000 in the, in the spot size that we can focus a beam to at a certain distance away. Now, the practical aspect of doing this would be you'd have to deal with the imperfections of the laser. But, but I think that the, you're really more asking about, you know, in principle, right? What's possible in principle? Yeah, we could figure it out. Yeah, I'm not sure. But it would be smaller than a green laser, right? By, it could be smaller than a green laser by a factor of about 1,000. However, however, big the, however big the spot on the moon is from a well-focused green laser on the moon, the spot from a similarly well-focused uh, photon at that energy right would be, um, would be 1,000 times smaller. I just don't know the numbers. Yeah, yeah. All right, so the question's been fantastic so far, so I think, Professor yeah. Eckstein, you're, you're happy to stay here and answer yeah. questions for yeah, about sure. more minutes? Yeah, yeah, so feel free to continue the questions down here. Let's thank Jim again. And thank you for coming. Mm -hmm.